Welcome to None Dare Call It Ordinary, a podcast that digs into the unusual, unorthodox, and downright unsettling beliefs found at the depths of the internet and the heights of paranoia. I'm your host, Dylan, and with me is the vivacious and Venusian Brent. Oh, are you using alien terms? Yeah, alien okay. terms. So you're an alien, so you're from alien Venus, clearly. Mm-hmm. And you are also a sexy alien, so you're vivacious. Oh, wow, that's, thank you. Which I feel, I mean, if you're going to be an alien, you're going to be a sexy one. I should have worn that jumpsuit, the jumpsuit with the belt, very sexy outfit. Yeah, and those fancy shoes that yeah. we uh, we put on the Instagram and the website. Uh, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, you should have worn it. And hey, Forrest is back. Hey! Hey, 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 hey. yeah, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> wow, we're already on the next episode. Uh, it feels like there is like no time in between this one and the last. It's just strange. Wow, God, for no time. Like it. It sounds like so. That's actually. I mean, that's a real thing. It's called. It's a phenomenon known as missing time. Oh, I hate to say this, but you could have been abducted by aliens. Like this is serious. Oh shit. Oh no. Oh. <laughs> How, wait, how can I be sure? All right. Well, OK, so well, let's be calm about this. We There's a checklist. So it happens that we <laughs> oh, have God, okay. there's a group of experts and they've got, you know, PhDs and all that kind of whatever. And they came <laughs> up. They have a series of questions to determine just that to determine if you've been abducted. Are you ready? I can. We oh, can do okay. this right well, now. I've never been more ready. So let's 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 do it. OK, OK. But before we do this, I want to let our listeners know that, you know, we have a, an incredible lineup of experts who've constructed this questionnaire. We've got Bud Hopkins, David Jacobs and Ron Westrom uh, are behind this questionnaire. And David Jacobs has a Ph.D. So, you know, it's legit. Right. Oh, fancy. so we can skip the missing time question. We already checked that off the box. <laughs> we already checked that box. So here's the first question. Have you ever woken up paralyzed with a sense of a strange person or presence in the room? Uh, Only when I go out and get wasted and then go home with someone I don't know. So, yes, yes, that's <laughs> that oh, happened. I, you know, I think that counts. Yeah. I think that counts. All right. Next question. <laughs> Do you ever have the experience you are flying through the air, although you didn't know how or why? Yes. Every time I go in an airplane, I don't know how aerodynamics or jet engines work or anything like that, but I'm pretty sure I have a feeling of flying. So there's that. So yes. Okay. Okay. This is and looking- you, you probably know why you're flying, but that's just- I, yeah, I know. I well, sometimes. <laughs> sometimes I'm so tired in the morning when you have to get up at like 4 a.m. Yeah. It's, I don't really know why I'm flying. Yeah. Like a red eye. So it's yeah. yeah. Someone like put a microphone in your face and asked you in your but, seat while you're flying. But the like, question Arr. wasn't how and why. It was how or why. So I feel that yeah. Uh, e- good even point. then, yes. I'm, I'm still okay. Yeah, could be either one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I gotta pay attention to those ors. <laughs> All right. So here is here's the next question. Do you ever see unusual balls of light in a room without knowing what was causing them? Yeah, I see them all the time, but actually I know what causes them. Ghosts, not aliens. So because orbs are ghosts, we know we all know that. Oh, that's right. The yeah. orbs. Did, didn't we discuss this still in, a, in like a previous episode? Like after you die, you wake up in the afterlife and realize you're reduced to a blob of light. So that's wonderful. Yeah, that's, Thank you, God. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's all you the get. Worst, <laughs> that's the worst part about the orb with, thing. With God, all <laughs> things are possible. So even being an orb, Lordy B, Lordy B. Okay, so next question. Uh, last question, actually. Do you ever find puzzling scars on your body and neither you nor anyone else remembers how you receive them or where you got them from. Yeah, but I'm a hypochondriac with somatic symptom disorder, so they're not real. So there's that. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, you know, I think I hate to say it for us, but I think they might be real. And I think you've definitely been abducted by no! the Vulcans. So, uh, Jesus, I'm sorry. No! I'm sorry to be the one to tell you. No. Actually, I'm sort of glad we're opening up about all this because, you know, on the last episode, Brent talked about how he's a reptilian that brought down the World Trade Centers and he abducted you as a child, apparently. So. Yep. Yeah, it's it's. <laughs> It's like therapy, (laughs) almost like hypnotherapy, but I think this one might be more useful. I I mean, the one thing I'm getting a kind of closure because I know who my abductor is. Oh, yeah. Looking right at him. Yeah. But you you have no idea. I I mean, I know that they're gray bald guys, but that's it. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, can you ever really know an alien? (laughs) No. And speaking of this reliable method for getting detailed instructions on how to build a UFO, what are we talking about today, Dylan? Well, today we are continuing our discussion on how to build a UFO, uh, specifically the work of Paul Potter mm. and his book. Which I can't remember what it's oh, called. There's so many titles. <laughs> take, take your pick. Take your pick. There are many Wait, titles that should be. You don't even have should to edit this. Are you kidding? Like any of us actually remember the name of this book in its entirety? <laughs> 
please. But the super official title is Anti-Gravity Propulsion Dynamics, UFOs and Gravitational Manipulation. And today we're getting into the nitty gritty. So last episode, we talked about some of the background. We talked about the main source of Paul Potter's information, namely uh, Betty Luca, who was known as Betty Andreasen and who was abducted by aliens, made a bunch of cool drawings that Paul Potter used to figure out how to build a UFO. Yeah. So we're going to get into the kind of nitty gritty today and finally figure it all out. And so I believe we're we're going to get started here, and I believe Brent has some information about the Black Vortex. Yes, this is chapter three, by the way, so open your books. Forrest took us through chapter one and two. Um, now we're going to get into it, as Dylan mentioned. Chapter three is called The Holy Grail of Astrophysics. And, and I do want to interrupt just real quick because yeah. I, we went over it briefly at the end of the last podcast, but we got to... Make sure everybody knows that Potter specifically says, do not build this UFO. Do not even try it. <laughs> it's far too dangerous. That's Especially yes. in your garage. Yes. So everyone listening now, you know, this information we're giving you, use it at your own risk. Just so you know, this is very important, <laughs> very serious. Also, you can't build it at the Pentagon either. Oh, Because yes. he you cannot point. use it for yes, war that's mongery. So. Specifically um forbidden yeah it's, it's a pretty small group who could actually use this information yes this is this this is the introduction to the crystal glass spheres so scientists don't understand ufo technology because rocket science works totally different than black holes and quasar jets which according to this author quote share some of their dynamic principles with ufos and you know what dylan um i wonder since the aliens apparently know even more than stephen hawking did about black holes and he was the most brilliant human being to ever walk the earth I wonder if they also came to the realization that philosophy is dead and model dependent reality was the reality. Ooh, you might be. So there's a couple things wrong with that. First of all, um, I don't think Stephen Hawking actually ever walked on the earth or not for (laughs) most of his life. Um, But but I think more importantly is that we learned that the aliens were either Christians to begin with or became Christian converts. So I think they went in the opposite philosophical direction. They became strict Thomists. I think they were they were really into. Uh, Aristotle and in the Middle Ages and scholastics. Oh, well, that's true. Um, and uh, Betty Andreasen did say they are Christians, so we can't lose sight of that. Fact. Oh, absolutely. And Stephen Hawking <laughs> was not a Christian, he um professes atheism. Oh, yeah, boy. so they're not into that at all. Okay, <laughs> wow. Potter brings to our attention the large spherical orbs we all know and love that are reported in UFO sightings which protrude underneath the alien spacecraft. He tells us they are made of quartz crystal or glass, saying, quote, As it will be shown in this chapter, these spheres are rather complicated, acousto-opto-magneto-electro-gravito structures. So something we're all familiar with, obviously. Yeah, yeah, obviously. You know, all this sounds like the makings of the ultimate X-Men villain, it sounds like. <laughs> yes, Acousto, Opto, Magneto, Electro, Gravito, man. Right. Just man, that sounds like the best Mega Man villain. And you got to fight. You fight him first because then you get all of these powers <laughs> and then you just kill everybody else. <laughs> So he states ET engineering is much different than, well, the only engineering there is and which I lovingly call actual engineering because of the, quote, multi-purposing and multi-functionality factor. He says that you need these quartz crystals, spheres to propel a spacecraft. You know, Dylan, I don't know. When we were doing our crystal healing episodes, I really think this is the true end goal to constructing the perfect crystal energy grid. You basically just make an alien spacecraft. So, yeah, that's why you have to be so careful when you're working with quartz crystals and you got to you got to cleanse them. You got to, you know, smudge them with the sage and you. You know, again, this is dangerous stuff. I was going to say is let's just hope the sage sage smudging is applied per strict instructions. If you read through that, listen to our podcast. Although, unfortunately, Paul Potter does not mention this. I think this is a key component that he's missing. Yep. So the aliens are way smarter than us dumb apes. That's obvious. They are. They have learned how to, quote, collect ambient energies potentially existing in the vacuum of space as well as utilizing the, quote, zero-point fluctuation fields, virtual energy fields, the Higgs-Planck fields. They also have learned how to, quote, manipulate space-time geometry. That's a nice try. I personally only adhere to the geometry of the sacred variety. But anyway, Mm. in such a, you know, sorry, uh, in such a way as to convert the potential energy into useful energies for their craft's propulsion, end quote. Well, if if we, again, kind of going back to the crystal healing, is that, Part of how crystal grids work is that you you take the sacred geometry and you kind of 
you copy it in the physical realm. Oh, so I true. think that's what that's true. These aliens are doing. They figured out the geometry of a sacred spacecraft, and then that's why the crystals are arranged the way they are. Yep. I think you, nice. Yeah. Okay. I think they might be using the sacred geometry. I also like how they can col- they collect ambient energies potentially existing in the vacuum of space i would hope you would probably you would focus more on the actual ex- energies existing out there <laughs> you know that's that's just your uh your brainwashed mind talking there yeah. so paul potter refers to aliens as quote et guys at one point he writes quote these et guys probably had to exist in space for many years at a time which is fun but also sexist yeah how do we know these are quote guys at all right i mean they are wearing uniforms how can one tell we need an alien me too moment i feel yes yeah yes. <laughs> yeah yeah i mean plus i mean if they are guys we can roll out the idea that the grays are actually future evolved humans i mean think about it come on social media troll experts tell me that well since male sperm count keeps going down and society at large is trying to emasculate men at every turn with their Gillette ads and all that, it is absolutely certain that future evolved humans are going to be these like beta cuck, uh, <laughs> lip tart, asexual trans bots or something. I don't know. Soy boys. Yeah. But, you know, given that the greys have dicks and Potter would know because he's an authority, then, well, they can't be our future selves. On top of it, they're completely bald, which would mean that they're just chock yeah, full of testosterone. Absolutely. Yeah, so. or they shave their heads with I Gillette that, razors, either way. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the author begins by reminding us that glass and quartz crystal are dielectric compounds and semiconductors. Potter says, quote, what lends credence to this assumption that UFOs are designed to draw in ZPF derived energy from outside for the craft to utilize in its drive system is that the large lower spheres of the AA UFO are specifically located so that they protrude outside of its metallic upper and lower domes. And so if you're I know you're following along fans here. So turn the page to page 90. <laughs> I'm absolutely following along. <laughs> and there's a detailed illustration of such a craft. So we'll look here. And you know, these illustrations are nice and all, but I question their accuracy in representing UFOs. <laughs> I mean, think about it. I can see the contours clearly. So don't they violate Potter's first law? You know, shouldn't these drawings be blurry? <laughs> oh, that's a good point. That is a good right, point. Yeah, absolutely. I didn't even think They're, about that. He's violating his own law. Li- I just I just want Potter to be consistent. That's all. Yeah. What it lacks in visual unclarity, it makes up for in conceptual unclarity. So I think that's why it's okay. Um, Because even though it's kind of a non blurry photo, the ideas are still very blurry. Um, And so I think it counts. I think it counts for that reason. So. Potter again brings up Betty Luca's abduction account where the Greys showed her how their spacecraft generated its power. These bright energy bars hovering around the top spheres, which looked as bright as a welder's gun. This very important moment in time is shown at the bottom of page 93, illustrated as figure 30, which apparently is also the front cover of the book The Andresen Affair, Phase 2. It's amazing Mm -hmm. cover artwork, actually. Great detail of basically just charcoal blobs. But, you know, I mean... (laughs) In this case, consistent with Potter's first law. Yeah. Yep. I'm looking at this drawing now, and I'm going to be honest here, guys. It looks like a chicken foot grabbing a ping pong ball sticking out of a spacecraft. I mean, yeah, it. (laughs) I I think what this points to is, you know, there was the hypothesis that these greys are future evolved humans, but maybe they're future evolved chickens. Yes. You know? Who knows what they're capable of? That's true. I mean, yeah, it's like if, if chickens could go from Tyrannosaurus Rex to chickens, surely, surely they could become <laughs> gray aliens. I mean, why not? That's true. That yeah, would be point. true, but um, that didn't happen. So, oh, that's knows? right. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I forgot. That's I right. forgot. We also learned in the last episode that there are no um, evolved beings. No evolved. Yeah, none. None of them are evolved, except for the evolved none. beings. Right. That's why Potter made the distinction to begin with. It wouldn't. You wouldn't say they're evolved beings if all beings were evolved. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Otherwise, otherwise, it's just a redundancy. You can only evolve in space is uh, is my is my take on that. I think that's true. Yeah. So then there's section 3.4 plasma. The electronic state of matter begins with about the 2000th, obviously. Obviously. Well, I mean, come on. The electronic state of matter goes without saying. So, <laughs> obviously. Yeah. yeah. So he yeah, we all that's old news. Yeah, that's old stuff. So he lists off a bunch of charged particles that are needed to operate the spacecraft power drive system. Yeah, I don't think we need to no. know which ones. Yeah, Just, we don't need that. There's a bunch of charged <laughs> particles involved <laughs> as far as we understand. 
Fair you can just kind of wing it through this part, guys. So we also yeah, learned yeah, that, yeah. you know. <laughs> so we also learned You're that You're not allowed to build one anyway, so you don't need to know all the that's details. True, that's true. We also learned that the strange pink to violet illumination operating inside a UFO, often described by an alien abductees as obviously UV ionization contributing to the necessary charged particle environment. So mm-hmm. it's not just to look trippy and cool. It's multifunctionality, bitches. I've, have you learned nothing? I have not, but I'm going to keep <laughs> going through this. I mean, I've learned you can write a massive tome without actually saying anything. That's what That's I've learned true. so far. Yeah. <laughs> this also, this, I wish I would have had this excuse when I had a bunch of trippy black lights going off and I was just, you know, being a, a lazy stoner, like, dude, like, it's not just look cool. I'm trying to, you know, contribute to the necessarily charged particle environment, bro. Like, uh, I would have been so cool. <laughs> So we're going to skip the next section on excite. No, you, no, wait, Brent, you can't. This is an engineering well, I can't skip book. It. I'm going to skip it. To I'm going to. You just, can't just <laughs> skip sections because you feel like it. What the fuck? That's a good point. <laughs> anyway, okay, we'll skip. We'll skip it though, just for the sake of. Uh, we'll skip time, it. We need the Spark Notes version. It's fine. Um, so lots of calculations in section three point seven. Again, you know, that's uh, we're going to kind of blow through that um, electron fusion and gyration, which reflect nicely into the truly stunning amount of time wasted in writing this um you know what you know what brand you know a dilettante ignoramus <laughs> would say that you know what you know what take that environmental science degree and just shove it up your ass this is big league <laughs> physics man geniuses like potter don't have time to deal with the likes of you god that's true yeah this is where this is where the real science is getting done yeah is in the physics everything is <laughs> yeah, physics everything else is know. just stamp collecting right yeah set of a contest stamp collecting actually um potter writes <laughs> that <laughs> So Potter writes that we need these calculations, which I just blew past, sorry, to a, quote, determine the magnetic flux density and force operating within a UFO type environment. So for us, you know, you Mm. need to understand something. I actually do have my degree in UFO type environmental science, so I got this. Oh, and I um, thought you were just this dilettante idiot. I didn't realize. I'm so sorry, Brent. (laughs) Can you please forgive me? (laughs) And that's also that's also the kind of environment where evolution happens is yes. the UFO type environment type. Yep, um, that's right. So that's why, you know, we don't live in a UFO on Earth. And so that's why we've never evolved. Good oh, point. Good point. Okay. And you've tied it all together. I also like how he still like one thing that I just kind of realized is according to Paul Potter, like if you're Paul Potter, this is an incredibly identified flying <laughs> object. I mean, you've got all these calculations He's clearly studied this extensively, and yet he still calls it a UFO. Well, does, let's call it an IFO from now on. IFOs. I like yeah. it. So also B, I'm going through these, A, B, here's B, to determine the charged particle and magnetic field interactions extending from the craft into the surrounding air. Yep. And, he, and then here's C. I agree with an that. Intriguing, <laughs> here's C, an intriguing theory about rotating magnetic forces acting on charged particles and diamagnetic materials wait no whoa, whoa whoa no one knows how magnets work slow your roll potter mm-hmm. all right so we have to get through one more here so d is providing quote the necessary calculations to determine if in a ufo drive system there are sufficient forces generated to initiate electron fusion photon fusion and even the transformation of protons into neutrons Obviously. Got to know it. Yeah. You yeah, have obviously. to know all of that stuff. So, yes. So it turns out that, quote, fluid flowing inside the toroid <laughs> shell will also supply electrical charges. So turn to page 99, everyone. Uh, figure 31 shows this. It shows mm-hmm. that, quote, some of the me- mechanisms which direct energy toward the top spheres. So just think chicken foot holding ping pong ball. Some okay, acoustic waves bounce. Got it. Some acoustic waves bouncing around are supposed to be important. Also, just one thing to let people know is this word toroid, which is like, ooh, that's a fancy. That's a complicated, fancy word. Yeah, I can't understand this at all. Toroid means donut. Basically, this is just a fancy metal donut. Wow. <laughs> so don't let that word. I don't think any of our listeners should be scared wow. off by the word toroid. Right. I was very scared of that word until you clarified for me oh you're Thank welcome you. in fact you know to me since there's a lot of these nonsense words i i say the deeper we get into this i feel that what potter is really going for is to create the ultimate nonsense poem something that would say put even lewis carroll's jabberwocky to shame <clears throat> twas imbued gravity 
and the electroacoustics did gear and gimbal in the wave. All mimsy were the magnetostatic groves and the optofluorographs. Nice. Ooh, Outgrade. that Beautiful. is deep. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, when the toroids, sorry, donuts, fluid moves there will result two flows above and outside the donut shell. So negative electrons will go towards the outer rim. The positive ions will go towards the inner edge toward the center of the spacecraft where the spheres are located. This, he claims, is nothing more than the engine starting stage of the UFO's drive system. You know, it's sad to say, I think at this point I know more about how UFO engines work than my own car engine works. So if I take my car if I take my car to an auto mechanic, I'm always at the mercy of them. I have no idea whether they're ripping me off or whether they need to actually fix whatever they supposedly diagnose. But if I brought my UFO to a mechanic, I think I'd be able to know if he was scamming. So, yeah, exactly. Like, dude, we all know the positive ions go towards the inward edge of the spacecraft. Don't True. don't lie to me and tell me they go to the outward edge. Exactly. Exactly. So know, know your donuts. Know your donuts. Section 3.10, toroids, magnetic flux, lines pulled into shape. They got to get into shape. That's right. You got to pull them into shape. <laughs> Those flux lines are looking a little... These out of, these out of shape. shape toroid magnetic flux lines. <laughs> There's an obesity <laughs> epidemic. <laughs> And those magnetic flux lines <laughs> are contributing to the problem. So Potter starts this section saying, Intriguingly, this craft is so well designed that for its pilot to initiate the energized sequence, all he or she would need to do is push one solitary button. I'm sorry, he or she? Such a rigid binary box Potter is living in when he's thinking about these aliens, you know? It's like, come on. Yeah, at first he just assumes they're all men, and now right. it's just men now or it's women. Hebrew. It's yeah. it's ridiculous. Yeah. I also like how this is the design this is the the sign of incredibly well designed machinery, is that it just has one button to start it. So <laughs> by by that right. reasoning, my coffee yeah. maker is the ultimate in just human <laughs> engineering, because it just has one button. That's all it has. <laughs> yep, yep. So technically speaking, this UFO would be very simple to operate and build. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Any dumb superior alien being could do it, you know? You know, as a rule of thumb, the words technically speaking should never precede the words very simple in the same sentence. I think that's a good rule of thumb True. to follow. Yeah, I think the operate I get if we're kind of living, you know, just you know, just living in this description for a second, because okay, you just press one button, but the build part seems this book is very dense. I <laughs> you know. <so. laughs> It just seems that way, Dylan. Yeah, I. that's just my gut feeling on the matter. So apparently the upper and lower toroid fields will yield themselves to the complete control of the sphere sets. Quote, and this is when all the panel lights come on in the pilot's control room. So all that for just a few panel lights, I guess. Unfortunately, the check engine light is going to come on, which, you know, we're going to have to walk through these steps again. I don't know. Did you did you make sure your chicken foot was fully grasping the ping pong ball before you begin? I'm not sure. Oh, man, the, the court, you know, it could be the quartz crystal sphere is cracked. It could be. Right. You know, the, all kinds of stuff. You know, the toroid, the donut shell, the positive ions are going in the wrong place. That check engine light can tell you anything. Right. So I'll continue on from the book. As soon as the inner ring is energized and the sphere sets begin to rotate and the vast amounts of electromotive force begins to be generated, this primary stage of exciting will quickly become sufficiently pumped up to initiate what I would term the secondary state of excitation. Section 311. Breaking and reconnection of flux lines. Reconnection part two. <laughs> more this is about a sequel. sphere sets. This is the sequel section. <laughs> right. So more about sphere sets. Apparently there are four that divide the upper toroid field into four quadrants of flux lines. I mean, what's a good UFO book without engineering book without mentions of quadrants? You yeah, know? you gotta have them. So flux lines, speaking of flux lines, are being broken and reconnected at rapid pace. The toroid's magnetic field becomes a pulsed and highly energetic field which generates large amounts of electromotive force in any nearby conductor lost me too let me clarify by continuing the pulsating <laughs> fields are directed through the top crystal glass spheres and through the upper half of the lower spheres so that these ah. interactions will in will initiate separate 
electrical mechanisms and any materials specifically designed to generate emissions. So, i.e., ceramic materials by these methods. Oh, ceramics. Uh, and they did, you know, are we doing some pottery crafts, breaking out the kiln? Oh, yeah. I mean, his last name is Potter after all. So, <laughs> that's true. Oh. <laughs> that was good. 3.12 top sphere emissions giving off bars of light. Top spheres are not just made of quartz glass alone, but obviously of a glass-like substance embedded with, quote, certain ceramic compounds which are known to emit electrons or photons. You know, Brent, no need to belabor the obviousness at this point. (laughs) I mean, this is all so obvious, I don't even really think we need to go on, quite frankly. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it's so simple. I mean, it's so simple to build, as Potter has already told us. (laughs) (laughs) He knows that we're a more sophisticated reader. We are duh. Oh, sorry. Too early. Just kidding. Um, Potter will bring us into the push button age, people. (laughs) The one button. With respect to the images of the sharply defined light bars seen by Betty Luca. Whoa. Again, breaking the first law of Potter dynamics, as Forrest told us. These are sharp lines. I mean, I I just want consistency. I don't even want real science. (laughs) I just want consistency. That's all I care about. (laughs) So with respect to the images of the sharply defined uh, light bars seen by Betty Luca, when the extraterrestrial showed her the workings of these spheres, it should not be too difficult to piece together the other components of this display of power and to understand exactly how this was done. I mean, it shouldn't. That's one hell of an extrapolation. I don't know. Maybe I'm dumb. I, I don't know. Never mind. Never mind. Actually, there is a pig. There is a figure on the next page, on page one eleven, explaining it all. And for this one, it's not a chicken with a ping pong ball, a chicken foot with a ping pong ball. Picture more a pawn chess piece piece with hair stuck to it. So oh, I like that. That's for a good visual image of that. Yeah. Um, I also so one we're thing gonna, I have to say ahead, for say. Potter is I like his humility and how it seems. Yeah. He hasn't done a lot of work. He just <laughs> he saw these images and just it's so obvious how the the UFO works on the basis of these images that he just wrote that down. He didn't have to really study very much. It was just yep. so obvious once yep. he said the pictures. Yep, yep, yep. Three point thirteen gyration of a cyclotronic storing field, which pretty much sums up. So we'll skip that. Uh, Three point yeah. fourteen. <laughs> Three intensities of the magnetic field of to aid emissions. So these are located on page 115 if the audience feels like they want to read it. And how can they not feel that they detail. want to read it at this point? Right. I mean, come on. Exactly. <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know why you're skipping these things, Brent. Yeah. You know, it's very important. I mean, well, I think he's, he's skipping them because, you know, all of this is obvious. All of this is simple. But some are more simple and obvious than others, in particular these sections. And so we feel it would be an insult to the listener. Uh, to go into detail about about these particular sections it's simple very simple 315 magnetic funnel creates a black vortex at the heart of the aa ufo quote the funneling of the of those field lines will of course create a vortex or miniature black hole at the heart of the ufo so potter coins the term black vortex for this quasi black hole he's been talking about because it's like a black hole but not really apparently Uh, okay you know, this book so is like that's, a black hole for reason and sanity. I think that's, I think that's really... Once again, Black is, Vortex, a uh, good band name. Ah, it is. I agree. That You know, if anything, Potter comes up with great band names. That's a, that's a consistent... Yeah. Yes, yes, that is and true. I, We've found so, so many. So I think if you, if you want to start a band and you want to do a concept album of this book, you have to call your band Black Vortex. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's true. So 316, Vacuous Force... Light converts to gravity. Now, this is when the shit gets good, guys. So, you know, actually, yeah. I'm going to go to a UNLV, ba- UNLV basketball game here in my hometown and, and uh, start holding up a sign that says Potter 316. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm a really big fan of this one. You know, yeah. I do appreciate Potter's frank self-awareness at this juncture. Uh, he certainly is speaking vacuously about physical forces. So, vacuous oh, force. Oh, oh, Yes. I mean, I don't know. I'm not a physicist, but I feel it. Yeah. So Potter claims that the black vortex will, quote, have a mechanism that converts electrical energy and mass into gravitational force and angular momentum. That makes sense. That makes sense. I I can see that. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's perfect. Done. 317. Clues forthcoming in the UFO's quasi black hole drive. (laughs) Potter says. So is it a quasi drive or is it a quasi black (laughs) hole? You're right. Let me start over. (laughs) 
<laughs> that's totally we don't want people no, we don't I want people you, like i think you said it right it's just black a, hole? okay it's unclear from it could be a real black it could be a black hole drive and it's just a quasi black hole drive or this quasi black hole drive. drive you know if brent didn't skip so many sections i think we would know I think the problem is that Brent has skipped. Let's you know, go back. Maybe, Let's start over. I mean, for already, us again, yeah. I think we've already said, yeah, I think we said in the previous episode that we are below the level of obviousness. That's why we have to do <laughs> these episodes because, you know, we want to learn and we just, we're not at the cognitive ability to just <laughs> look at these pictures and immediately get it all. Yes, that's right. So continuing on with the quotes, Potter says, you're worth more dead than alive, George Bailey. Oh, wait. That's, <laughs> sorry, wrong Potter. I'm, so that's... <laughs> Merry Christmas, you old mothership! Merry Christmas, you sli- slimy face hugger! Merry Christmas, you high IQ crow! Merry Christmas, Exeter and Brack! Merry Christmas, Spock! Merry Christmas to you, big black monolith! <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. It's a wonderful abduction. (laughs) Anyway, Potter says, quote, this black vortex will be recognized as the cone field that Betty Lucas saw and described as spinning like a whirling tornado inside the craft. Oh, shit. I like black. A black hole can spin. I didn't know that. I mean, I guess I did know that. You did. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. So I'm not a physicist. I don't know how you see a black hole spin, though, I guess is what I'm not. No. Yeah. What do I know? I'm a my dilettante ignorance and (laughs) self-aggrandizing egotism are getting the best of me. That's the problem. I got to put that stuff on the I got to leave that baggage behind. Exactly. (laughs) Trust in Potter's judgment. True. Always. Always. And Potter, I trust. So certainly some of those phrases heard by Betty and recalled through her hypnotic regressions have provided invaluable clues to the electrodynamics of the crafts that she had been introduced to. So yeah, just to clarify, that is a quote. Yeah, that is a quote. That's a quote. Yeah, I did. Yeah, that is a quote. I'm not just saying. The problem is that you're not reading Um, it in Potter's voice, so no one can ever know. Right. (laughs) Just (laughs) certainly some of those phrases heard by Betty (laughs) and recalled through her hypnotic regressions. Yes. Anyway. But and we all know this is the way great science is derived through hypnotic regressions, but we've already <laughs> yeah. established this. We so did learn I'll that keep last continue. Time. Newton, Einstein, Stephen Hawking, all via hypnotic regression. <laughs> exactly right. I wouldn't doubt that that I wouldn't doubt if Newton was into hypnotic regression. That's true. <laughs> he was into alchemy. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And catching counterfeiters. Those bastards. <laughs> and Bible code. He was real into the Bible code also. Yeah. So Ooh. well, we all make uh, mistakes. Yeah. So on page 121, Paul Potter talks about Lorenz forces, curvature radiation, and toroid, toroid, sorry, donut diffusion layer, Mm -hmm. and so on, but finishes the paragraph with, quote, so does anyone wonder why I haven't as yet tried to work out the mathematics of all this multifunction functioning? (laughs) So, you know, this isn't a question. It's actually an explanation. Any ideas, guys? I think he was saying it rhetorically. I mean, isn't it obvious why he hasn't worked it all out? He's so brilliant. Such a multidisciplinary expert. That he doesn't have to. He just knows it. And he also <laughs> knows the danger. I mean, he knows that as soon as he builds this craft, you know, the Department of Defense, the Pentagon, the elites, mm-hmm. the U.N., mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. they're all going to be just honing down on him. And so I, I think it's for political reasons. It's not that he can't. Sure. It's that we know he's committed to avoiding warmongering at all costs mm-hmm. and so committed that he won't even work out the mathematics for how this UFO works. <laughs> So three section 318. This is the final section in chapter three. Dear God, this oh, is thank, chapter thank God on the coherent <laughs> on the coherent amplification from its black vortex. And ending this chapter, Potter admits he hasn't fully answered the question of what exactly the crystal glass spheres do. He has, however, shown quote with unparalleled success. <laughs> I feel that the AA UFO can be compared to an actual black hole. I love the humility here. Again, it's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's unparalleled because nobody else has ever tried to explain all this crap before. So it's, it's also <laughs> an unparalleled failure. It's both. That's that's the kind of the double edged sword of being first. You're both the best and the worst. <laughs> all right. Chapter four. Ferroelectric emission sphere fabrication. So, you know, for sure, some fabrication is going on here. But <laughs> yeah. Low hanging fruit. <laughs> So section 4.1 starts with the photon generator of gravitational forces. 
So this chapter is about upper spheres, all in caps, in the alien craft. The UFO, I'm sorry, the IFO is des- designed <laughs> around a, quote, miniaturized black hole, the black vortex. We already know this, so this Potter. I don't know why he's repeating <laughs> <I know>. this. <laughs> Just doing a review, I guess. So the black vortex needs the right type of energy to keep it running, which is mass and magnetic force. It is the, quote, job of the four top spheres to provide the charged particles and conversion process of turning electrons into photonic energy so that this photonic energy can then be directed into the craft's central black vortex to keep it powered. Mm. Upper spheres, you know, black vortex. I actually think the Catholic penthouse magazines may have a uh, competition here. UFO <laughs> orgasm oh. magazine, if you will, right? Or is that a little too much? Oh. Oh. Ugh, that was i'm gross, really disgusted actually. all right um <laughs> yeah black vortex yeah, magazine oh, who knows God. what that's about I imagine moving on 4.2 electrical mechanisms working in quartz glass potter shows a bit of skepticism here wait what well, shows a bit yeah, of skepticism wait hold, hold on right. just a bit wait, this is this is a new potter here we go all right potter Quote, but if the top spheres are merely made of glass or quartz, then there doesn't appear to be that many ways through which electron and photon emissions can be produced. He calls this theory, quote, a bit suspect. Yeah, I'd say it's maybe a tad suspect. What do you think? (laughs) I'm going to suspect it. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to suspect it. (laughs) 4.3 magneto electric oscillations from magno oh for fuck's sake <laughs> it's magneto stricting come on magneto strictions yeah. what is this it's the Freaking easiest Russian word names? in the whole book so if these court i'm just gonna skip no one cares so if these court spheres had <laughs> magneto strictive inserts they could be put into alternating states of strain this is clearly illustrated on the next page on 431 obviously so I, I said chicken foot ping pong ball, grabbing a ping pong ball. But now I'm thinking more claw crane arcade game. You decide. Well, you know, we'll post the picture on Instagram. Maybe you could see. Yeah. who? Yeah. I'd be interested to see what our, our listeners think, because I've yeah. I've tried. Is it a chicken it, foot? It, is the strange it? thing about those is that they look really familiar. I feel like there's a perfect there's a perfect description. <laughs> um, well, you're just, uh, we're getting you're just regressing from your abduction experiences. <laughs> oh, That's why no. they look familiar. <laughs> No, not that. <laughs> Section 4.4, magnetostrictive and ferroelectric ceramics in spheres. So ferroelectric materials, ceramics, are the key to making these upper balls work. <laughs> keep that in mind. Mentions the Dal UFO, 1986, left behind some, quote, iron balls. Well, they busted these <laughs> balls, obviously, as one does. And inside, once you bust these balls, you'll find magnesium iron nickel. Etc. Yeah, etc. Sorry, I forgot about the etc. Shit. Retake. No, I'm I just, I just also like, like this is like we're trying to figure out how this UFO works and like, what are these, you know, what are these spheres made out of? Oh, magnesium, iron, nickel, etc. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like a bit more clarity on the composition of the spheres. Other things that you find on the cereal box. It just keeps going on. Ooh, and two percent of my daily intake of riboflavin. <laughs> So 4.5, ferroelectric emissions and polarization reversal emissions, yep. which is self-explanatory. Skip. Yeah, we can uh, 4.6, colored luminescence from within the spheres. Ceramics can emit energy that will be a specific color. Potter begins this section in the grand tradition of using the Betty Luca alien abduction account and retrofitting it to fit scientific details, or as Potter puts it, quote, in trying to find a scientific explanation to these pulsating energy zones from the Luca account. This would be a good, I think the, I think this UFO would be good for a rave. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. I think <laughs> it would be, uh, it would fit right in there. Yeah. I agree. I'm also imagining the mothership from the uh, Parliament Funkadelic stage shows. <laughs> I bet they were. I bet they were talking to these aliens. Oh yeah, for sure. So he discusses how in Betty's account she mentions glowing red, blue, green, then white, while also seeing long wires or rods embedded inside these glowing spheres. He says photoluminescence helps explain what is happening here. I don't know. I got to be a bit skeptical here. I don't know if I believe that claim. Everything else he said up to this point, I believe, but I got to I got to oh, pull yeah. the brakes here and say I feel that. <laughs> yeah, so far the only false claim. Um, <laughs> is there not a note book? for this Possibly I can false look up? Claim. No, nothing. Mm-hmm. 
Okay, so 4.7, quartz or glass, crystalline or amorphous. Quartz has a repeating lattice structure, unlike glass. Therefore, a glass can act as a, quote, host for charge donating materials, i.e. ceramics. I actually can't speak to the figure on the next page. I did look at this. I have had some mineralogy classes and geology classes, so it's correct on the crystal lattice structure of quartz. This is correct. That's literally all I can talk about about this book. But I, I mean, you're lucky. <laughs> yeah, you're lucky. I, I, I still haven't understood anything yet. <laughs> so at least, at least you understand actually, you know, something. <laughs> Brent is at a 2% and we're all at a 0%. That's, yeah, it's more like 1.2. But Brent, yeah. Brent's slightly um, above us in the ob- obviousness uh, category. So. Yeah, he's, Brent is 2% evolved, I think, at this point. Oh, we're all still at nice, zero. Nice. We're all... He's getting there. He's, you know, inching slowly in that slowly direction. Slowly but surely. 2% macro evolved, too. <laughs> Yes, oh, not of course. micro. That just goes without being said. So with all this quartz talk, I do wonder if that's how you would know there's a problem, though, with your UFO engine. Your quartz spheres are dirty, which is not the same as a smoky quartz. We've yeah, already absolutely. established that. You can have a um, cleanse smoky podcast. quartz. Right. But if your engine's messed up, eh, quartz may be a little dirty. Keep yeah, also, I like how glass is, it, it could be a host for charge donating materials. So glass is kind of like the salvation army of you know, <laughs> UFO materials. Um, they're donating all the charges they can. It's true. And you'll get a real good deal. I have to. OK, actually, you know what? Salvation Army may be going out of business. I was there yesterday and it looks like it's going down. Oh, really? Yeah, there was nothing. I went to the Salvation Army. There's no books. There's like one shelf of books. Sad. But no one reads. So it doesn't matter. And this book's not there, unfortunately. Aww. It will be when we're done with these episodes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it, yes, it will be. That's yes, so true. <laughs> we got to spread the yes, message. So, okay, I'm going to quote this. This um, this is 4.7, so I'm going to quote this in full. Potter says, quote, I hope it will be appreciated how the scant images recalled by Betty Luca and published in all the Ray Fowler books are becoming quite invaluable to this study. And they will continue to prove invaluable when it comes to progressing any earnest RD lab work for UFO construction at a later date, as will all the other pieces of information learned from the hundreds of abductees whom have experienced some of the other technological advances at first hand under the watchful eyes of the extraterrestrials those big black eyes hopefully i hopefully a way will be found now that this ufo information is coming out of the closet to build up a coherent knowledge base about extraterrestrial sciences that scientists from all around the world can pull from the develop and develop into as a conditional non warmongery step forward and be put to use for a civilian public. Yes. Yes. End quote. I, I want my PhD in ET science. I know first I got to get my master's, you know, in uh, ET sciences, but knowing me and now I follow Bill Crystal and David Frum on Twitter, I'll probably just use this knowledge for warmonger anyway. So that's it's the only thing you're capable of. You're already me. tainted. <laughs> plus you're, you know, true. plus you're an alien. So that's true. I mean, that's, true. that's, that's the true. sad thing is you already got it. You're the, the neocons have got a grip <laughs> on the aliens themselves. That's the worst possible <laughs> outcome here. And, you know, I do think like neocons obviously cannot get near this technology is far too dangerous. I do think President Trump, though, can be trusted with this knowledge. I mean, after all, everything in this book makes as much sense as anything he's tweeted or said. Yeah, he so. might be the one person who could build this spacecraft. I trust <laughs> him. I trust my president with alien technology, personally. True. Yeah. I mean, it's only got one button. <laughs> This reminds me he has the nuclear button. Anyway, <laughs> uh, <laughs> daily uh, reminder <laughs> of that one button he has control of. Okay, uh, four point eight. A crystal's acoustoelectric photon wind, which is also a good psychedelic Ooh. folk band. Name. I like photon um, wind as a as a <laughs> band name. That's wind. great. Yes, Simon and Garfunkel. And we're of sailing this upon the photon <laughs> winds. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, blow it in the photon wind. <laughs> the answer is blowing in the photon wind. <laughs> Potter declares he's not going to use the Betty account as, quote, proof for the above assumptions. So that's nice. I was going to say, we don't need to solve Buddhist koans for the first time <laughs> to figure this shit out, which I like. 
Instead, he uses Betty's account as the basis for what he says next when he discusses a particular group of diagrams Betty drew. On the following page, Potter includes these sketches, which, quote, show particularly clearly the carbon quartz-like lattice structure that the extraterrestrial grays showed Betty. What was shown in these holographic-type images was essentially a solid crystalline structure inside which was contained... What? Inside of which was contained. Come on, Brent, read the gibberish smoke. clearly. What are you doing? <laughs> Damn it! I can't read this. This is unreadable. Plus, plus it shows, shows structure. particularly clearly the carbon quartz-like lattice structure. I mean, again, violating his own law. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Particularly, particularly clearly. Yeah, can't instantly refuting his own no way. stuff. So, uh, yeah, let me start the quote over here. What was shown in these and those holographic type images was essentially a solid crystalline structure inside of which was contained wind, smoke, or gas, same thing really, and lightning, very, very frightening, (laughs) all as if an arrested status, all as if an arrested status. So I'm assuming with their hands up behind their heads. So (laughs) Good. So Potter muses... Is the photon wind, the wind gas lightning being depicted by the extraterrestrials in this strange, anogalous representations for their power materials? Obviously. I added that, obviously. Obviously. And again, I'm pretty sure photon wind is a Mega Man, Mega Man villain as well, I would say. <laughs> photon wind. I feel, I feel like I played Mega Man soccer and photon wind. I think wind. it's photon <laughs> man and the special ability is photon wind. Oh, oh that's right. That's right. Nice. That's right. Yeah. 4.9, sphere fabrication with soul gels of silicons and lanthanoids. 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 Quote, where can the special glass crystal material needed for the UFO spheres come from? Certainly, I feel it would be rather naive to think that the ETs are using in their UFO power drives some odd chunks of quartz crystal they might have found on a beach somewhere. <laughs> like, sea gla- like sea glass? I don't know. So anyway, um, very beautiful. On some exotic planet with double shadows. <laughs> so, no. It's not, it's it's naive to think that aliens found crystal chunks on a triple shadow planet. Come on. Double shadow planet confusion is understandable. So that's yeah. just that's just obvious. But and I mean, we did talk about in the crystal healing episodes, people who were very irresponsible with their crystals and who thought about just donating them or just, you know, throwing them away. <sighs> and so yeah. this isn't I think Potter is without right. decharging them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Because, you know, people don't they don't cleanse their crystals before they donate them. So the ETs know this. <laughs> and so they're not just going to you know pick up some random crystal on the ground because who knows what intention has been imbued into it. That's right. Good point. So Potter is totally right here. Yeah. Potter says that this special unknown glass for the spheres have been formed in the cores of distant planets formed under high pressures like our diamonds are here on planet Earth. Oh. So that's good. So I guess Potter doesn't think the Earth is hollow? Oh, shit. This guy. This is hollow Earth disinformation. Yeah, it is. I'm really disappointed. Few more sections here. 4.10 surface faucets to enhance electron and photon exchange. But you already know this, right? Yeah, yeah, everybody. At this point, if you don't know that surface faucets enhance electron and photon exchange, then you've really not been listening and you better go back to the beginning of the book and try again. I mean, that's true. Yeah, I would just go back to episode one. Um, and then we'll we'll post a, a quiz on our on our website, and then if you pass with a ninety percent at least, then you will be allowed to listen to this episode. You can yes, retake it yes. too, so that's fine. But yeah, so four point eleven whirling zones inside focused acoustic orbs. So that is actually a really good ninety synth electronic experimental bands album title. <laughs> 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 inside the acoustic orbs so the real be- you know oh, i don't think here. i don't think actually you know i don't think i'm going to take this book to a thrift store like we were saying when i'm done with it i think i'm going to keep it just for the band names i think is, yeah it's just a yeah. good yeah. point of information for that that's so true And also building a UFO. Um, Quote, the real beauty of these arrangements will be that the black vortex will consume most of the annihilation photons and subatomic particles churned up in the numerous atom busting mechanisms around the four top spheres. Atom busting. Yeah. And that is why the top spheres are far superior. I'm sorry. Superior. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> to the lame, barely noticeable lower spheres. Yep. 
Sorry, Dylan. This is all very platonic, too. The beautiful spheres. Yeah. It's all here, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Last section of chapter four, 4.12. Permeability switching caps around top spheres. Betty was shown these caps. Just, just so you know. Yeah. So, you know, speaking of caps, you know, honestly, I'm not even obviously going to talk about this entire section. (laughs) I'm just going to make a joke. So speaking (laughs) of caps, you know, this is a legitimate science textbook because of Potter's excessive use of capital letters. Mm. In fact, yeah. In Mm. fact, from sections 410 through 412, I collected all the capital letters and wrote them down in a diff- you know different arrangements to see what I could get a sentence that sort Ooh. of makes sense and I think this is Potter what Potter is truly trying to tell us so the Bible Code's guy's son would probably appreciate this but we'll get into him later and it are these it's these words you put them all together and you move them around and it says in all caps and then could through but I just changed it to throw away so <laughs> I guess we could just throw this book away now so we're good. <laughs> <laughs> just toss it in the trash. Yeah, Don't yeah, give yeah. it to Salvation Army. Yeah. And we were commenting how on the first chapter of the introduction, Potter used a pun about getting off the ground. Mm. And we did say <laughs> that he capitalized ground and he you corrected me by saying he didn't actually go presidential there. Yeah. I have to say at this point he has gone presidential. <laughs> yeah. So I feel Finally. this time is time yes. for him to just off himself yeah. at this point. If you go all that way, that yeah. So instead that, of know. donating it to the Salvation <laughs> Army, what you do is you drive to the Salvation Army, you get to the front door, and you look at the garbage can next to the front door, and you just put it in there, and then you go home. <laughs> <laughs> oh god! So okay, I'm going to sum up my final summation here. For this is the this is all of Chapter Four. I present to you my entire section in just a few words. Betty crystals. Obviously. Boom. Thank you. Good night. Perfect. I'm leaving. Yep. And those words should be written on Potter's tombstone, I believe. (laughs) In all caps, obviously. Okay. So there was a lot to take in and all that information was false. And so I'm going to be covering the true information now. (laughs) Uh, Starting with chapter five, (laughs) gravitationally polarized power spheres. And in this, you know, chapter, we're talking about the lower spheres. Yeah, fuck upper spheres. Wait, wait, sorry, that was my section. So immediately yeah, your forgot. section was below yeah, me. Your, your false section. This section, this is the good <laughs> stuff. This is those lower spheres. So in talking about those spheres, uh, Potter says, quote, different clues have been forthcoming about what these lower spheres are made of. So, quote, there may possibly be a quite different format added to the fabrication process. Um, and I got to say, this is written like he doesn't yet know what the rest of the chapter is going to say. Like, you got to go back and edit, man. Like, you know, he knows what he's going to say. <laughs> and, uh, speaking of editing and doing the outline for this podcast, I think we prob- probably performed more spelling and grammatical corrections for this book than Potter did himself. Just <laughs> yeah, so that's that. true. We didn't want to have to say sick like 150 times. And so we just actually just, you know, did some uh, correcting. Uh, for Mr. Potter. I had to change, like, just, I had to mess around with the punctuation just so I could actually read the quotes without <laughs> them not making any sense whatsoever. So your gibberish can make a little bit more sense. Yeah. It, yeah. The gibberish is a little less gibberish. Yeah. At least, do we, yeah. Do we also talk about, speaking get a of, sense of what he's grammar saying. and format, we did, did I talk about the, he didn't succumb to the tyranny of margins, right? Like the margins are just non-existent. It's just right at the top. Yeah. Of it just page. goes Boom. right to the edge of the page. Yeah. And the bottom just right to the end. So that's fun. Good. Good. That's the way a non-elite writes. So in fact, Potter feels it necessary to offer a warning that the unraveling of this rather new and radical format will offer the reader more than one opportunity to raise an eyebrow or two even before the end of the chapter. (laughs) Yet they aren't unusual enough to affect your third eyebrow. So, I mean, it's kind of (laughs) weak. Yeah, right. Only E.T. guys have three eyebrows. So that's just obvious. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Us lowly humans, we don't have Mm -hmm. the, the third eyebrow yet. Also, at this point, I should mention, I got confused, but all the chapter headings... Uh, four chapter five pages label them as belonging to chapter six so you gotta stay sharp here. <laughs> well maybe you know these aren't actually oversights I mean, after all Potter did say the best science comes from riddles so <laughs> oh maybe that is it maybe there's <laughs> some secret Riddler, message that yeah. I've been missing so Potter here he offers an explanation for the crystal honeycomb images given to Betty Luca by the aliens turns out it's a depiction of the quote realignment of anions and cations huh? not a bad idea 
Potter continues, but then this is not using the genius of the extraterrestrial designer. <laughs> you know, I like, you know, Potter does have some deference to the extraterrestrial experts here. Ah, the you know, it's not, they're not, yeah, they're not affected by the dilettante ignorance that us human scientists are. Potter recognizes that at this point, the reader might be getting a little drowsy. So he says, quote, at this point, the reader might be wondering, what on earth is the point of all this scientific plasma babble? And I apologize for all this tech, but I do promise that it will all make sense very soon. Once your full transformation <laughs> into your alien body is complete. Exactly. Oh, so exactly. That's the goal. You, you know, there's nothing like writing a book and basically saying, I know this is all a bunch of gibberish, but hang tight. It will turn into <laughs> English soon enough. <laughs> soon enough. Once the hybrid program is complete. <gasps> <laughs> So Potter offers further explanations of Betty Lucas hypnotic regression sessions. Quote, what was seen by Betty and drawn by her was a long wire network, which was embedded inside the UFO crafts, lower spheres. And from the fact that they appeared to Betty as if they converging sick from outer <laughs> extremities of those spheres into a small hub near the top of them, just about where those spheres hook into the stem coils. Then it would suggest that those wires were especially embedded inside the AA UFO spheres for the same purpose as wire meshes are used inside the NRA meta materials. I said I NRA. Just, yeah. It's, it's, NR, <laughs> NRI. NRI meta materials. Sorry. These aliens are uh, pacifists. Dylan, that's true believe. that's true no warmongery from them <laughs> the ron paul aliens from oh, my no. dead cult six fingers <laughs> no, but then he says uh you know since i'm an ignorant dilettante i had to look up what meta material means and google tells me it's defined as a synthetic composite material with a structure such that it exhibits properties not usually found in natural materials especially a negative refractive index and uh, which was kind of disappointing because when I first heard the word, I thought I might be able to finally solve the mind body paradox if I had access to meta materials. So I was kind of <laughs> yeah, the mind, about. the mind is the meta body. <laughs> exactly. So That's I good. figured if I had meta materials, I'd be able to actually sort it out, follow the paramechanical uh, things. But yeah. that didn't happen. So not today. Not today. <laughs> Very sad. So Potter thinks that these wires will revolutionize all electrical science, quote, but without doubt. The fact that the AA UFO spheres have inclusions of wires in them marks a particularly significant breakthrough in the understanding of the whole field of UFO electrical power sources. And dare I say it, it may even change the way science, capital S, looks at electrical yes. power generators on this planet with regard to fuelless suppliers of energy for almost any household electrical appliances, and perhaps even with regard to small power units for automobiles. Hmm. And again, I'm glad science is capitalized. Yeah, and he should have went a step further and put it in all caps. Though, if you remember, guys, I have my degree in science with the capital S. So. Yes. yes. So he's, yes. he's speaking my language finally. Yeah. Is your degree in all cap science? Or oh, just it's actually S just science? one S. Or I mean, sorry, the, the first letter S is capitalized. Oh, So yeah, yeah, once you get your master's degree, then it becomes like, I think the first three letters are capitalized and then PhD oh. is the full science capitalized. Oh, <laughs> and you <laughs> know, I think <laughs> Potter is finally showing his hand here. I mean, I wish he'd stop beating around the bush with all this new age stuff and spiritual essences <laughs> and all that. And just, you know, come out with his uh, scientism. I think that he should just come out and declare his scientism mm. once and the yeah, true enemy, agree, the yeah. true enemy of of us all, of us all, and also I I, I want to reiterate that this these claims he makes about breakthroughs in science and and all this kind of stuff he got all this because the UFO contains wires. Like that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's what this is all coming from. You know, wires can say a lot, especially the way Potter's brain is wired. Uh, that's, yeah, that's I that can tell you. We should a take lot. a deep a deep look in there. We got a neurologist to our a neuroscientist to look at Potter's brain. I'm sure that wiring would say a whole lot. Yeah, some synapses are out of order. <laughs> You know, also, I, you know, I had the opportunity to look at the previous edition of this book, which is just published under a different name. And between that one and this current edition, he added that bit about the automobiles into the Ooh. later edition. So that's ah. like that was a crucial addition. Nice. He felt keeping, he needed to make. Yeah, he's keeping up with the latest technology advances, so technological advances. It's good. Finally. Exactly. Exactly. OK, so these lower spheres have this wire metamaterial mesh. Turns out the network quote, ideally needs to be one to five microns in thickness compared to the 70 micron width of a human hair and should be made from monoatomic copper or gold. No, no, no. Potter knows what you're thinking. Quote, 
This arrangement may sound quite exotic, yet it is precisely the arrangement that has been found at the site of a UFO incident in Russia and subsequently diagnosed in recognized laboratories across Russia. Looks like this is another job for Mueller. Yeah, he's no. going to bust us all over. <laughs> no, you know, I don't know, guys. Guys, come on. He's too busy busting witches right now to go on an alien hunt. Like, yeah, this. Yeah. Yeah. The witch hunt needs to take precedence over the ET hunt. I agree fully. Yeah. Come on. Once they're all burned, then we can move on. Exactly. <laughs> Continuing the quote, this was proposed as a result of piecing together the evidence which came from the burned out remains of what seems to have been a glass like sphere operating inside the Dalnagorsk UFO, which had overheated and had partially disintegrated. Thankfully, though, there was enough correlative evidence to show that this UFO, which made a soft landing on top of a hill, had utilized a very similar type of electrical power sphere to that of the Andreasen UFO, because it also showed evidence of having several types of ferroelectric ceramics inside its rather volatile host material, which could well have been very unearthly type of glass. And if I'm understanding this correctly, all this evidence comes from a bunch of grainy photos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's how you know it's real. The blurrier, the better. So it's yeah, exactly. That is the first law, after all. By the way, I think uh, we need to backtrack a bit here. Potter's second law is something like, wires can tell you everything about anything. Yeah, and wires, <laughs> that's how you know something is advanced. That's oh, it's true. got wires. <laughs> Boom. Yeah. And so this is where Potter kind of breaks down the, this is also known as the Height 611 UFO incident. This, uh, you know, a, a UFO incident at uh, Dal Nagorsk. And uh, he talks about how verification of the above hypothesis may be found in the extensively researched and highly informative reports prepared for a Russian UFO investigator, Valerie Duzilny. So it appears that all of Potter's evidence comes from this guy and his report and his metallurgical analysis of the metal found at the scene. Hmm. So I did a little digging on this character, and it turns out that uh, Duzilny, ooh, that's a hard one, so he's doing a metallurgical analysis, and it turns out he's a botanist. <laughs> yeah, he studied metallic plants, obviously. Yeah, the metal plants, so he's clearly qualified. Yeah. And I was curious, like, what kind of facilities is he working with? Well, quote, in his four-room apartment, the scientist has established a laboratory equipped with obsolete Soviet-era tools. <laughs> so that's You how know that this story isn't true? Nobody could have afforded a four-bedroom apartment in the Soviet Union. I mean, come on, let's get real here. <laughs> that's That's fair, especially a botanist. <laughs> You know, maybe if he was like a nuclear engineer, but maybe. (laughs) And we're going to end this episode with chapter six. And this chapter is all about fluid and how it is used in the toroid or excuse me, fancy metal donut to generate electricity. I can no longer allow alien indoctrination, alien subversion and the international alien conspiracy to sap and impurify all of our precious bodily fluids. Well, it turns out the aliens don't need our precious bodily fluids. Uh, We're going to learn more about the kind of fluids they need. Nice. So once again, Betty Luca is an important source of information here. Quote, Betty Luca has described seeing these glass wheels as having inside them four thick cylindrical extensions that look like many cables welded together. For my working hypothesis, I have taken this description to mean many tubes welded together. You know, as if Betty doesn't know the difference between cables and tubes. What a sex. Yeah, seriously. (laughs) Yeah, you, you know, and you always want to get your UFOs tubes tied. You do not want any little little UFOs flying around. Be smart when building your UFOs, guys. Yeah. Also, all these wires, it's basically, I'm just envisioning it looks basically like behind my TV and VCR uh, area. <laughs> just a VCR, what? Uh, <laughs> DVD player. Blu-ray player whatever. Oh, did we just fall into a time warp here? We did. <laughs> get the laser discs out. Yep. Anyway, guys, you want to play with Pogs after this? Okay. <laughs> But this isn't all that Potter learned from Betty about these wheels. Quote, that Betty saw these conducting tubes terminated by crystals, which were box shaped inside these glass crystal wheels, offer an indication that the most predominant factor to them is that both their inner and outer faces are parallel. This suggests quite strongly that they might be used to mirror amplify whatever beam goes through them, just like a master crystal mirrors its energy beam to amplify it so as to bounce that beam back and forth between its mirrored faces to pump up the beam's amplitude. Uh, Also, Terminated by Crystals is also a good doom metal band name, you know? Oh, yeah, I agree. So that's three band names. I think think Skynet needs to start looking into crystals, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. (laughs) So after going through why all this matters for the magnetic electrical such and such going on, Paul Potter reminds us that, quote, this configuration in the AA UFO is very simple. <laughs> <laughs> That's why this. Yeah. 
<laughs> that's why the, the this book is you know as thin as an ikea furniture instruction manual yeah so. exactly yeah Basically. i'm sure fisher price Basically. could start selling these ufos and parents could put them together for the kids in no time no time at <laughs> all okay so this donut hole thing generates beams awesome where do they go they go through the toroid wall of course obviously yes <laughs> Now, you might be confused, but Potter kind of sets us straight here. Quote, electrons being pumped directly through a wall? Well, yes. If you consider that an electron is, after all, something that enjoys particle wave duality. And I know that's something our listeners consider (laughs) 24-7. And build that toroid wall. Build that toroid wall. (laughs) So just to keep it up to date. Oh, God. It's wait. I think that I think that if the uh, president actually kind of accepts the duality of his wall, he could say, (laughs) It's not built, but Ooh. it is built. <laughs> but then, the, and he wins. The problem no what. Is, is about the particle wave duality of illegal aliens, and so they could just slip right through. It. <laughs> I think that's the main. That's the the main flaw in the wall. The distinction between legal and illegal extraterrestrials is the legal ones have to be Christian. And yeah, so <laughs> Betty Luca's account is yeah. that um, is about that's the good point. true aliens that are illegal. <laughs> okay, so I know everyone is wondering. So, okay, so we're shooting beams into the toroid shell, into the fluid, but what kind of fluid? Potter thinks it's water, Hmm. but sadly, Betty Luca has not been forthcoming on this. Quote, in the case of the AA UFO, there is nowhere in Betty Luca's recollection of that particular UFO structure any indication whatsoever of what might be contained inside the toroid shell. So, this factor has been adjudged partly by what has been deemed the most appropriate fluid for this whole electrodynamic system, and partly from the evidence which has showed the extraterrestrials were observed taking on board water prior to them performing a mechanoelectrical ionizing process on that water. Certainly! It would seem highly likely that the AA UFO's toroid will be filled with an ionizable fluid and that this fluid will be a hydrogen based liquid such as fresh water or seawater so that it can be easily replenished. But there is even more evidence for the water donut theory than just that. And wait, certainly or highly likely? Or is it certain that it's highly it's likely? It's highly likely that it's certain. Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> so, continuing the quote, To lend credence to the water theory is the fact that several observers of UFO activity, other than Betty Luca, have reported seeing UFOs hovering over the sea and over lakes, apparently drawing up into them huge quantities of water. That those UFOs were also seen dumping some water back suggests that whatever they do use in their craft becomes depleted in some way. Betty Luca herself mentions watching this phenomenon, and she does actually mention seeing sparks of electricity flying all over the place when the process was taking place. Also, I did check because there was an endnote here because he talks about several you know, observers. And rather than telling us who these several observers are, Potter cites one abductee who is told by the aliens that they use water for power. So we don't, you know... We're not getting the full story here. That's good enough for me. Yep, it's good enough for me for sure. So also, I'm pretty sure whatever is going into the water that is turning all our frogs gay oh. is UFO juice, not just some chemicals Ooh. put there by the globalists. The globalists so. are aliens. They're oh, the true, the true internationalists. <laughs> are They're the universalists. That's true. Uh, that's even worse. <laughs> The note we're going to end on here is something you might be worried about. Okay, so, you know, even Potter kind of brings up this worry, quote, water and seawater does suggest a lot of weight to be carried in this flying craft. But then what is weight? (laughs) And (laughs) all I know is that weight isn't weight. (laughs) That's all I know. And truth isn't truth. Yeah, it's the Giuliani theory of weight. Oh, guys. It also (laughs) explains uh, the uh, recent report about Donald Trump's weight, I think. If you just oh. take on this this view on board. Ah, you, yeah, you know, guys, weight isn't I, weight at all. I, come on. Potter's just being poetic. We're just not reading things in context. You should dabble more in ufologist apologetics and then it'll all make sense. We need to find like the That's William true. Lane That's Craig true. of ufologists <laughs> in order to guide us through this stuff. You know what? You're right. And so, in, you know, in all seriousness, Potter explains this by referencing the black hole in the center of the craft. Remember that? No, because it's called a black vortex. That's true. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> Get it right, it's get UFO it right. it, or a black hole ish. So basically the water will have so much gravitational attraction to the middle of the craft that quote, <laughs> this UFO's fluid won't have anything that could be regarded as weight. And I'm still not sure why the weight of the water would cause it to just smash through that fancy metal <laughs> donut. Like when it goes towards the black vortex, but you know, that's just my dilettante ignorance talking. Yeah, yeah that's what it is. Yep. You got to factor in like seaweed and other things too. So, Oh, the seaweed. Yep. That's true. I didn't think about that. Um, and so 
that is it for this episode. I hope everyone is still listening and you know still <laughs> clearly understanding all the points about how to build a UFO. So, Brent Forrest, what did you learn in today's episode? What did you find most interesting? Uh, do you want to go first, Forrest, while I try to remember well, what we talked I'd about? Like- I would I would like to go first. The only problem is I didn't learn anything. So <laughs> that's that's the issue. I would like to what say. What did you so, find most interesting? What did I find most interesting? Um, God, it's I guess just- it would have to be that the um, yeah. Hold on, I'm I'm really uh, grasping here. One sec. <laughs> <laughs> it's all just like a blur of. A, a blur of a blurry uh, image, like a blurry image, really. I learned. That, oh, yeah, I did learn that toroid <laughs> means donut. So I guess. That's, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's pretty that's much all I remember. I, I did learn that. So that I did not know before. Yeah, and I forgot that you know aliens are globalists, which I mean I knew that, but now you know I, universalists. I'm sorry. God I'm sorry. Damn, you're right. right. God damn it. Universe. Galaxyists, even. Yeah. No, universalists. It's far beyond <laughs> the galaxies. It's all the galaxies. So basically, no. we learned no. donut. No, they should be meta meta universalists that are like the multiverse, multiversalists. And I think that would be Yeah. They basically they come from all of it. I think that's what we know for sure. Yeah. And whatever all that stuff out there is, they're into all of it. And what yes. about you, Dylan? What did you learn? Did you learn anything? I I like the I like the water thing. Yeah. I liked how they, you know, they got the fluid in that toroid is this the water. <laughs> and I liked, you know, that's kind of fun. And that's why they're that's what they're doing with all that water. And I just wish, you know, and Betty Luca didn't tell us what that was. And it's just, we got to just go off other accounts. We got to extrapolate that. This is why it's so good that we have Paul Potter to kind of walk us through (laughs) this. How he was, you know, if we just relied on Betty Luca, we wouldn't know. But he was able to, you know, put in the critical thinking necessary to turn those sadly, sadly, clearly drawn photos into something useful. (laughs) You know, and I now that I think about it, I did learn that weight is of an ambiguous nature. So like next time I go to the doctor and they check my weight and I feel that they are, it's a little overweight, I'll say, but what is weight anyway? So. <laughs> yeah. Next. Yeah. Next time I go to the doctor, I'm going to make sure to bring a black vortex with me. <laughs> and so then it'll look like I'm losing the pounds. <laughs> All right. All right. And once again, that is it for the end of this episode. So if you want to uh, let us know what we got right or what we got wrong, and I'm sure we got wrong most of this, (laughs) um, if you want to to give us some kind of explanation for what is going on here, be sure to send us an email. None dare call it ordinary at gmail.com. Also, you can visit our website to find all the sources we used uh, for this and all of our series. And you can also find links to our YouTube page. You can find links to uh, subscribe to the podcast, which you, of course, already know how to do. Also, just links to other episodes we have done and all that kind of stuff all that could be found none dare call it ordinary.com and with that we are done